Tuesday, July 21st, 2020, 2020. Hope everybody's having a great day. We're uh, joined in studio and out of studio. There's Fred behind the glass. So Fred, when you watch later, I'm waving to you now. Um, and we have uh, Allison behind the camera. Allison, good morning to you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, David stepped out for a minute. He's working hard, as you know, on the technical aspects of the show because sound has been a problem at times. And the grainy picture has been a trouble at times, but we're told that on Friday or so, we should be good with that. Uh, Maria will be joining me in a moment, our guest, Maria Schultz. She's here with me, as is Catherine and Olivia. Good morning to you as well. So um, let's get to the basic uh, elements of the show. And then we have some viewer mail. I think my first viewer mail, maybe the first viewer mail to the show ever from Fred. Again, it's the, kind of the Fred show today. Fred behind the glass, Fred in the mailbox. It's not Fred's birthday, but we can make it his birthday too. So, any event, today in history, we'll follow our weather. If you're looking outside, it looks kind of nice. I can't see out the window because they have this sort of box in here, but when I last saw it about five minutes ago, sunny, warm, going to be uh, in the 90s, kind of your typical summer kind of day, maybe some showers later, more likely showers tomorrow, but hot, humid. If you're going to be outdoors, better to be outdoors earlier rather than later where that heat really ramps up, so please take advantage of the nice weather if you can. Uh, but it is a regular summer day in New York where it can be very hot and humid. Um, in terms of the day in history today, um, today was actually a sad day in 2011. It was the end of the space shuttle program. For those of us who are interested in the space program and um, were woken by our parents to see the first landing of the moon and thinking of all the things we've done in space, I think there's a bit of a resurgence at play, but. Uh, the Space Shuttle program ended formally in 2011 on this date. Um, also, for those of you literary uh, buffs, uh, one of our more famous authors, maybe not the greatest writer of all time, but one of the more powerful and influential ones, Ernest Hemingway, was born today in 1899. Um, sad life, a lot of tragedy in the family, but uh, an author of some pretty memorable works, uh, Farewell to Arms, and many other uh, pieces of literary history. Um, in terms of Birthdays. Can we peek and see if we have a staff birthday on site? Is that we, we do have one staff birthday to to focus on? Actually, we have three, but one in particular. From the resident standpoint, O Valdez, you know who you are, and we wish you a happy and healthy birthday on this July twenty first, twenty twenty day. Um, there are three staff birthdays: Eugenia Upton, who does work at Riverwalk, her birthday. Uh, Corona Miller's birthday today. And then we have one sort of local birthday, which will, if not now, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But while we're waiting to see if we can do our local birthday, our very, very local birthday, let's talk about the menu for today. And we'll read it off the bigger piece of paper. Well, if you're in the mood for garden vegetable soup, today is your day. Because we have garden vegetable soup, we have beef and pasta, and we have uh, cinnamon apple sauce. That's your lunch menu for today. And for dinner, no, uh, not yet. So you let me know if we do. And for dinner today, if your guess was minestrone soup, you're right. It is minestrone soup today. Eggplant parmesan, uh, linguine with garlic oil. Very Italian day today. Very interesting. Dessert not so Italian. Um, orange sorbet. I don't consider that. Uh, um, um, I just look at Catherine as I was saying that. I don't know, Catherine, you like myself, or a juicer, you like to juice. And I got my first request, because I do a lot of juicing requests for family and friends, and I was asked for watermelon juice. Oh, that's 
which really, it's very watery, right? So I would imagine the yield on a watermelon probably yields a lot of watermelon juice. Yes, it does. Probably easy, quick, and very easy. cut away the rind. Lemon and lemon in there to like brighten it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe in a future show, you and I could do a juicing segment. Absolutely. Because I do love it. Um, I think that candles will save our birthday celebration. There's a programming note that I think I have. We have a cancellation today. Um, Art History with Elena is canceled today. Sorry about that. 11.15, we do have song celebration with Claire. And at 2.45, we had a musical note with Peter. So those are still on, just the one cancellation of Art History. And this show rebroadcasts if you want to see it again. Um, uh, tonight at 6.30, I think it is. So why don't we hold off on our localized birthday celebration, of which we have actually a prop. Uh, forget this out. There we go. With no lighting, but that's a different conversation with those you know, smoke detectors and stuff. But why don't we welcome Maria, who's uh, arrived in her limo from her office, just probably 200 yards Thank away. Thank you for sending it. The driver was very lovely. Good we had a little morning, exchange everyone. last night. She was talking about hair and makeup, and I was talking about sending the car, because neither one of them happened. Well, no, you probably do hair and makeup hair. normally. We're not here to critique that. But Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here with everyone again. Nice to see everybody. We're happy to have Catherine back. A little deflecting, so you're not the focus. Is that the, exactly? I do that. Because we're going to spend well. the, the spotlight is now on you for the next. Okay. What do we have an hour to do today? I have work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so when I have my opportunity to host, which is Tuesdays, I like to see if I can um, bring out little pieces that aren't always discussed. Okay. So you know, in the part that, that perhaps is important to cover, that's expected. You have an important role here of helping to um, not only find ways to bring people in who need our services across the board, but to make sure they're safe and the people are safe when they come in. So maybe you could just spend a minute how things have changed in this time of COVID in terms of your work with hospitals and people to get people in who want to enjoy our services and our facility. How has that changed in COVID? So I think the biggest change has been twofold. One is that we are no longer allowed to do in-person tours. And for someone that's looking to bring their loved one into a long-term care facility, it's a bit daunting, especially if they've never been here before. I mean, you can show pictures, you can do videos, but it's actually not the same as walking through and saying, this is where we do this, and this is where how this works, and this is where the nurses' station is located. Your your mom or dad's room is just down the hall. The dining rooms are central to this area, so it's it's hard to get that across over a phone call mm -hmm. or even a FaceTime. That that's been the number one thing, and the second thing has been the when they finally do make this decision. Yes, we have to bring our loved one in, even during this challenging time of COVID. It's made even harder because they're not allowed to see them transition. They're not even allowed to come upstairs and help them get settled in or make their bed or spend those few hours with them. And they rely on the staff to do that in their place. So we bridge, the admissions department bridges that for them, okay? They'll drop the loved one at, at, the, at the front door sometimes, or if they're coming directly from the hospital, the ambulance will bring them. They then rely on us to inform them of, okay, your mom is in her room, the staff is with her right now, you'll be hearing from social services if there's anything else you need. They'll often check in with us numerous times during the day, does she have, what's her phone number? And at that point, it's up to us to reassure them that they've made the right decision because there's a lot of uncertainty. And it's not until they actually hear from their own parent or they see them through a drive in visit that they're like, okay, this is going to be okay. So we end up spending a lot of time just really being empathetic, compassionate, and understanding that they've done the right thing for their family member, but it's not always an easy thing. So the center of all this, and I want to hit it from a few different angles, is trust, right? Absolutely. I mean, so you're used to building trust in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Talking on the phone, meeting people, exchanging information, touring. And all that trust now is transferred into the responsibility of a phone call, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Maybe a virtual tour, maybe looking at pictures, but it really is about trust on that side. And also, it's really about trust on the other side because our facility is such that we want to be careful that people aren't coming in with this COVID infection as well. 100%. So our residents who look at your function uh, as an important one do it from a, perhaps a different standpoint to make sure you're protecting them mm -hmm. from bringing somebody in. So. Talk about the conversations you have with prospective people coming in 
and ensuring that they're of good health. Okay. I'm always told to turn my phone off before the show, <laughs> and I did that to remind people that I know to turn my phone off. Because I just showed you how to do it. I just did it live. Who so, edit that out? <laughs> okay, so prior to our policies have evolved a little bit as we've learned more about the disease. And as we all know, there was a time where we were able to accept COVID positive patients into our COVID recovery units, which I personally thought was a very successful. And they were very much segmented. Completely way. segmented. The, the staff and personnel worked solely in those units. There was no cross going from GP3 down to GP main. It, it was really, really done well. It was really, really done with a lot of care and a lot of forethought. And never once did I feel that we were endangering anyone, whether it was the patient, the staff member, anyone, in that whole process. And it's something that I felt was very successful. As, as we all know, though, we were prohibited from continuing to do that. And so that changed things a little bit once again. So now we're kind of the gatekeeper in admissions in that we need to ensure that we have all of the medical information up front, that it's been clinically reviewed, that we have COVID negative tests from any resident that or new admission that will be coming into the facility. And until they are actually COVID negative, we are not allowed to admit. This goes for the, our long-term patients. We've brought in long-term people over the last week who on their own have had to go and get a COVID negative test and prove to us that they are actually negative before they can come back into the facility. So really quite a responsibility. I mean, you're really the safeguard yep. uh, along with the clinical team to make sure that people coming in are. Yep of good health, they're not going to spread the infection, and you know, things have changed a lot here, you know, we've worked together throughout this entire crisis, and we were dealing with the multitude of infection, and now things are much more under control, we don't, and we work hopefully to stay that way, but we don't all be, but it's been a challenging time, how has it been for you, just as a person, to go through this process, you're an employee, you're doing a great job, but as a person, how has it been to deal with? So I feel a lot of responsibility to ensuring that we've done everything we can. And there's always that thought in the back of your mind that, you know, what if they get it on the ambulance, get it from someone in the ambulance coming here? Yes, they tested negative in the hospital, but then they come here, that, that resident will go out to the hospital two days later for something totally unrelated, but I kind of hold my breath a little bit till I know that they didn't go out because they were COVID positive. So there is that sense of responsibility that you need to do everything you possibly can to protect the people that we're bringing in as well as our staff. We are trying to minimize this god-awful disease from even coming in anywhere near our facility. We're not there yet, but it's certainly something that's at the forefront for us. And you personally dealing with it? You know, we talk about tennis a lot. Yeah, I think we both yeah. like to play tennis. We do. Are you finding ways to escape the responsibility and the pressure when you're not here? Right. So I'm a big outdoors person, as we've talked about before. I used to love to go to the gym. A soul cycle was one of my favorite types of things to do. Mm -hmm. That's obviously a Does thing that of the exist past. anymore for anybody? So it actually does out in the Hamptons where they have oh, so more outside space. Under tents and they're and they're exactly. Yes. But our local studios where I live and in right. the local towns have all closed because anybody that's been to a class like that, you're literally, you know, not even this far from the next rider. So yeah. that's gone by its wayside. I've gone back to running outside, which I don't really really care for too much, but you have to do something, and as you alluded to, David, I get out and try to play tennis every time I possibly can. There was a time where we were, I belonged to a local club, and there were so many regulations, like in, in order to serve, you needed to wear a glove. Well, for anybody that plays tennis, wearing a glove when you're serving is, it's just... And when somebody the ball goes into somebody court, which happens all the time. You're not allowed to pick it up, you have to swat it back. It's so it's, I mean, we're making it work, but it, I'm really happy to be back out there again, and. It's something that I hope to continue to get better at. I think I'm a fairly decent player, but there's always, I'm a very competitive person when it comes to that. So if you ever want to play. <laughs> the gauntlet has been thrown down. Wow. <laughs> I happen to be very competitive too. Well, the show will be ending. We're headed for the tennis court. And, um, you know, Maria, you've been at the home now for, how long has it been officially? Uh, 14, 15 months. It probably feels like seven years, right? Because of all you've been through and the time has gone by quickly, but it really, there have been so many highs and lows with obviously the last six months being, being a, a low in terms of that it was scary, but also a high because, and I've mentioned this to you before, the, the staff that we have here is absolutely incredible. The way they've stepped up, the way they've 
are just cross facilitating departments and, and doing everything that they possibly can. You know, various people, everyone from administration in the C suite to the CNAs. Everybody will just pick up and do what needs to be done, whether it's doing the um, testing center or transporting residents. Or it's amazing how this staff, as professional as they are, have come together and it, everybody's ready to wear whatever hat they need to wear. Nobody sits on something and says, oh no, I'm so and so, or I'm in this department, I can't help out in that department. And it's really, it's really been something to see. And I think, feel that's why we've been so successful and able to, to accomplish all that we have. You know, it, it's interesting to think about the journey, your journey, other staff who, you know, you didn't come to do this, right? I mean, it, it wasn't like you decided 10 years ago you were going to come and play this role at the Hebrew home. But you feel like you belong in doing it. I mean, you just fit in so naturally. What was the pathway you were on? What, what things did you pursue in careers beyond Hebrew home before? So originally, um, after college, I moved into the city and I always liked architecture, project management, and I actually um, was in commercial real estate management and development, um, worked managing high-rise office buildings, one of which used to be called the Burlington House on 57th Street, it was a 50-story building. Uh, it's still standing. Um, good to know. Good to know, so I didn't mess that up too badly. <laughs> Had it been down, we would have ended the interview shortly. There you go. <laughs> Had it for tennis. But that was my first exposure to really working with the unions and the, the contractors within the city, and that's where I first learned to read blueprints and where I first really had my taste of project management when, not to be sexist, women weren't really big in that world. Commercial real estate management and development, if you go back 30, 35 years, was predominantly male dominated. So, I mean, I did something, I, I went and got my Black Seal license. For people that don't know what that is, it's an actually a certification in heating and ventilation and air conditioning systems. I was one of the, only a few women in Manhattan that had ever done if that. If you had that on the trivia board, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I never heard of it, exactly. I don't have it. I'm glad you do because your responsibilities have now changed. You You'll be doing some other things around the home. Facilities management, here I come. No. Um, and then from there, I... But tough to be in a male. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, really, to, to break through and to be taken yeah. seriously. I mean, yeah. kidding aside, that couldn't have been an easy task. Yeah, no. No, it, it wasn't, but it, I was up for the challenge. And at one point, I actually thought I'd go back to school for architecture. Okay. Um, decided not to go that route because I really was loving the, the commercial management and development and I found it new and I found it exciting and I liked seeing things develop especially from the ground up. You ever deal with our current president in any spaces or any? No, no, no I haven't. I, I worked for Fisher Brothers, I worked for a large developer. Um, at the time it was called First Jersey National Bank. They were since bought out by National Westminster. We developed a good part of the Jersey City waterfront. And it's hot, hot space, right? Yes, big hot space, yes. right? So the old Colgate building, and for anybody that knows Jersey City, right. was kind of the mainstay of where that was. And it was kind of nitty and gritty. It wasn't the greatest place to be at that time, but from the development of that waterfront all the way up through Hoboken, it's one of the hottest places to live now. So it's amazing how real estate can transform an area. Um, the views are spectacular from there, but... I was born in New York, so I'm, I'm happy to be back here. So you became a black seal or whatever. <laughs> I whatever. didn't. <laughs> I got a certification. By the time the interview's over, you, you were, you're on the seal team. You're, I'll be a ninja. You're invaded. You did all kinds of things. Green you should have done. You, 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 you the Hudson to, to start the day. There you go. Um, after that? After that, um, moved to Jersey, got married, started a family did not want to continue the commute to and from the city. It was just wasn't worth it. Took a number of years off to raise my family. I have a son and a daughter. And, and their names are? Max is my son. He's um, in California? Max is in California. Max is an artist, really a cool artist. This is why I draw viewership, because when you mention them, then they have to watch. Oh, OK. So, so watch Max um, works for an artist by the name of Jay Nelson. Jay Nelson used to be the resident artist for Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. Cool. Yeah. So, we'll name drop for you. Uh, well, this you said viewership. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing what I can to divert you. Mark is watching. I doubt Mark is watching. But anyhow, so Max's niche and Jay's niche, um, Jay kind of took Max, my son, under his wing, 
and they build tree houses and incredible spaces for Google executives out in Silicon Valley. Very cool. It's so cool. So these are for their children, for themselves on it's their properties? For themselves on their properties, and but they'll do things like they'll build rope bridges between the redwoods, and, and, and at the end of that rope bridge there will be, you look up Jay Nelson, you, Max isn't there yet, you can Google Max, but not too much will come up on him, but Jay Nelson, amazing that the, the work they do, they do, and a lot of it's using reclaimed wood. And the purpose is for people to have something to enjoy when they're not exactly. working, exactly. to relax, just to... Yep, as an escape, to be back out into nature. I love uh, it. Yeah, so their daily world in Silicon Valley is techie and electronic and monitors, whereas this vacation world that they're creating is anything but. What if we get a treehouse here at the Hebrew home? Wouldn't that be neat? It'd be a unique <laughs> place, and maybe we, could, maybe we could pitch Ooh. them. <laughs> Well, we have a black seal who could do the building, but maybe it might be something unique and different to do. It, it might be. It might be. The problem is I can't go. He can't come here because he'd have to be quarantined. So, and I can't go there. Yeah, COVID's in the way of everything. Yeah, it's in, damn it. But, uh, yes, yeah, so that's my son. My daughter, Alexandra, she goes by Allie, is actually now living with us. And the reason she's living with us is she was accepted into medical school. Well, congratulations. Thank you. She's at New York Medical College. And as we all know, most children's schools were suspended in the spring. So no point in having her in an apartment and whatnot. And she is now and Learning is with remote us. for that too? Or they go? Learning is remote. That's a hard one to learn remotely, huh? You know, David, I would think so too. So yeah. she, they just got noticed about two weeks ago that there's, she, she's, she'll be second year that all of their learning will go online, except they will have to come into campus on rotational shifts for labs. Okay. Which, okay, for somebody that lives 20 minutes from school is okay, but what does that international student do? Mm. Right? That's gotta be tough. Yeah. There are a lot of things that you don't think about which are completely different now. Yeah, yeah. Does she know what kind of medicine she's looking to pursue? So she's been from, she wanted to be a neurosurgeon and then someone said to her, you would have no life if you did that. So she's thinking, maybe dermatology. <laughs> well, that's a totally, you're talking about the two ends of the spectrum. She's also a second year medical student. She's got a long road ahead. Has she gone through the hypochondria phase yet? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Always a treat to talk to medical students. You know, you're learning about every disease and illness. And for those of us who are hypochondriacs, as I am, I could not do it because I would be like, hmm, yeah, <laughs> that looks yeah, a little funny. Yeah. Feels a little different. <laughs> yeah. Mom, what do you think this is? <laughs> I'm scratching. <laughs> but anyway, no, both both great kids, uh, loves of my life. They're both independently very, very strong, and um, I'm just happy that we're that close. Great. And in terms of other than tennis, things you like to do to other than fitness? And so there was a time when I used to love to play bridge. But the problem with bridge, I know some people here that would perhaps mm -hmm. get you into a game. I'd be thrilled to play. With, so if, if make note. Yes. Always yep. chasing bridge people. That's a big one. But the only problem, right, is how. What do we do? You have to wear gloves now, right? Because bridge is a lot. Of well, we're tested, so I don't think we can figure something. Yeah, out. we'd have to figure something. Oh, if anybody would like to do a bridge group residence, I'm in. I'm in admission. <laughs> Sixteen, eighteen is my. Just catch her after her swim across the Hudson in the morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or she's not doing the HVAC system. <laughs> And I guess the last thing that keeps me really busy is about um, about a year ago, I decided I wanted to go back to school and get my master's, which is something I always wanted to do, but never took the time to do it. And I'm more than halfway through. So I will hopefully in the spring be graduating with my master's in healthcare administration. That's great. Very impressive. But you know, <laughs> you know, for those who are watching who haven't met you, because perhaps they're residents and, and didn't come through in your time, whatever, maybe perhaps they'll have a chance uh, to stop down and say hello, or you're passing in the hall because I know you're involved always in supporting everything. You're one of those people that just make this place better all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you meet somebody, and I know when I met you that was true, and I've told you this off camera. Mm -hmm. You just know somebody is belongs here and is, has that special quality and um, you know sense of humor to go with the intelligence. I've done with skills I never knew you had either. Or you're redesigning the HVA <laughs> system <laughs> and stuff, but. Um, You've been, uh, you know, a breath of fresh air and a welcome part of this team. And having worked through you, through the uh, this COVID stuff with you, certainly, you know, um, there's no end to what you're willing to do and what you did. Thank um, you. I really feel I found a home, and I, I really appreciate all those kind of things. Huh. So I don't know if we have our birthday localized, you know, but Maria, for being on Thank my you. show, 
every guest gets a pizza. So you will oh. choose your topping. You'll have a pizza delivered to you. It's lucky for sometimes my Sometimes you spell pizza. things out in the toppings, but, <laughs> or, or not. Maybe <laughs> spell out HVAC or something. <laughs> or black seal, or the sausages, or something like that. Not sausages. No. And the cheese, or something like that. Anyway, um, it's great to work with you. It's great to have you as a guest. And, Same. Thank you for having me. Um, we were going to do, so she's not here, but Susan Shevlo, whose museum, is that, was no, that her that's piece? Claire. So Susan Shevlo, whose museum we're in, who graciously has allowed us to use the space, I don't think we ever stopped. She said, sure, you can use it for the first day or two, and we've never left. Um, it is her birthday today, and we had a little surprise to sing to her and to wish her a happy birthday, but we could leave that on her desk. But if you're watching the replay later, um, we wish you a happy and healthy birthday. And we thank you for your teamwork and support in this uh, wild time to allow us to create a TV studio in your, in your museum. It's, it doesn't happen every day. Um, but all the best to you and many, many more. Um, to Allison, thank you as always for running the camera. Catherine and Olivia for your support and leadership in this project always. Maria, yeah, I hope it wasn't as painful as you thought it was last time when you refused the first four or five times I asked you. <laughs> it was really a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's also not true. <laughs> no, that was fun. It was a pleasure, but you agreed immediately. Um, and we wish the residents a beautiful uh, Tuesday. Enjoy it. Get out early. Um, watch out for thunderstorms later. And um, and thank you. Anything that I didn't cover, Olivia? Oh, good. wait, wait. I'm looking at Fred. And I'm opening the mailbox. How could I forget the oh. one thing I had to remember? <laughs> I hold in my hand. It's like the uh, Johnny Carson uh, <laughs> Karnak. Yeah. I hold in my hand an envelope. It's been on the porch and Funk and Wagnalls and whatever. Our first viewer mail. My first viewer mail. Our first viewer mail. From Fred. I don't know if it's to me. It just says from Fred. It went to your email, but I'll consider it to me. Fred, I'm looking at you as I'm, I'm, I'm honored to leave your first voicemail for the show. Well, this is not a voicemail. This is a... He left it on a voicemail. I transcribed it for you. Okay, it was a voicemail. It's <laughs> not really mail. It's, it's mail-ish. But anyway, here it is. They were happy with the audio. It's been fixed. So hopefully everybody's hearing me say that. Larry's a great guest. Everybody should know. It. Larry was on the first show yes, ever. And yesterday. I came like second time yeah. and wrote our jingle. Great guest. His live performances are fantastic. Did Larry write this or Fred wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> and David is the greatest host that ever. Oh, no. oh. It's not on, it's not. I added that. He's loved by all, did a great job. Thirdly, you indicated yesterday was Ice Cream Day. I don't know who talked about Ice Cream Day. That was, and it was straightened out. It's not Ice Cream Day, it's Ice Cream Month. Though I don't think we're featuring ice cream today in our desserts. No. We have sorbet, so some disconnect there, but ice cream ish. Anyhow, Fred, thank you for your voicemail, which turned into an email, and for your interest. Um, we hope other residents will continue to do that. And how do they leave those? They have to dial extension 2813. If you dial 2813 and you leave a voicemail, Olivia will turn it into um, an email and stick it in the, stick it in the box. Yeah. So we'll close that so the next one comes. Um, and we wish everybody a great day. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on Tuesday, July 21st.